I'm Simon Dubay. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Kinsey Institute. I specialize in human sexuality, aerobatics, and space sexology. So aerobatics is the study of human-machine erotic interaction and coevolution, and space sexology is the study of intimacy and sex in space. So that's my bread and butter. That, that is uh, what keeps me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> that's what keeps you up at night. I love it. All right, let's dive right in to robotics. So, uh, I mean, we call it aerobatics, so like eros, which is uh, the Greek term of uh, the, that means uh, eroticism, uh, erotic, uh, the, the root of a very complex concept that means both intimacy, sexuality, passion, even friendship, and um, just general motivation to engage in. Um, and combined with botics, which uh, bot at its root means uh, agent, which uh, and refers to technology. So it's it's really like here, we, when we talk of, about aerobatic technology, we talk about technology that has some form of agential capabilities and that are uh, deployed or in, embody persona or can be perceived as related to uh, eroticism. So intimacy, connection, human connection, sexuality, and so on. And aerobatics as a field study our relationship and our coevolution with these technology and the emergent, the, uh, the emergent agents that uh, are being released on the market and are affecting our um, intimate lives. Oh, yes. I actually recently interviewed someone who was telling me about a story of a man who has married a robot. So the first marriage has already taken place. I'm sure there's many more to come. And she was telling me that this particular robot actually would send him good morning messages while he was gone and ask him how he's doing and ask him if he needs anything. And when she was describing to me the interaction of the robot, it actually, I'm like, that sounds nice to just have something that is only focused on your happiness and how you're doing. And I can see how it's meeting a need of someone. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, what's great about technology is uh, that it's, it's relentless, it's infinite, it's constant. Uh, it's also great that the more different kinds of technology are being evolved and combined together, the more agency uh, these machines can have. So when we talk about, for example, sex robots, people um, often assume these very complex humanoid robots. Right now, we're more in the realm of um realistic dolls with some robotic heads and some some movements but the more you add for example chat gpt or other large language models and neural natural language processing capabilities the more you add text you the more you combine it maybe with your replica uh, as a, a, a conversational agent the more it's able to interact with you in in complex ways that um, are not necessarily just purely sexual in the sense of having sex uh, that people might assume but just have this constant connection with something that can ask you a question, makes you feel good, inquire about your well-being, uh, can make jokes, can can flirt with you. So um, I, I think one of the important things that uh, we need to understand is that the more we combine these technology, the more they're able to have uh, a broader spectrum of agential capabilities, uh, whether that is having sex or sexual stimulation to more complex, intimate relationships. And I think that's uh, what a lot of people are seeking. It's it's meeting um, both needs. It, it's meeting their physiological needs and their sexual pleasure needs, but it's also meeting their needs to just connect with others. Absolutely. And obviously, as you describe the dynamic of that, it reminds me of Live Jasmine because so many members are on Live Jasmine to have a need met. I interviewed a member last week who said, yeah, the sexuality got him in the door. He's been a member for 14 years, by the way. And I asked him, well, what's kept you for 14 years? And he said, the talking. Exactly. I mean, some of the, the connections and relationship that we can envision with these machines are in many ways, especially during the transition period that um, these technology will become again more capable of a broader range of behaviors and, and personalities and, and whatnot are quite similar to uh, what you could find on Live Jasmine. Um, these are technology mediated connections and uh, 
yes, people assume uh, with some good reason that people go there for sexual pleasure and that's good. People go there to masturbate, to be sexually stimulated. That's definitely something that gets them in the door. Uh, but those who actually uh, tend to stay for longer periods of time is because of the emotional connection, uh, because of the experience of sharing about oneself and others, about learning about human sexuality, about their bodies, about their themselves, sharing deep, dark secrets about their relationship, about their desires and whatnot with someone that they feel is not unbiased, but just human and judgment-free. And I think the judgment-free component is extremely important and is also something uh, we don't talk about, about technology. It's great to have someone or something to talk to that um, you can be completely honest with. And we don't have that uh, in many spheres of our life. So Life Jasmine procures that in many ways to a lot of people. They, they respect everyone's body, everyone's preferences, uh, the uh, the models, uh, not, not being necessarily formally trained, but our experience trained into dealing with the complexity of human eroticism are an incredible resource for people to just be themselves and feel heard and, and then stay. Uh, obviously, there's a money transaction component into it, but that doesn't prevent them from gaining some of the amazing benefits that uh, this require when these relationships just continue to evolve in, in meaningful ways. These relationships are meaningful uh, to people, and um, I think we should just uh, acknowledge and respect that, and and see the like the beauty in that. Yeah, it's interesting. As you're talking, I am really seeing how you know relationships with robots, relationships with cam models. These are very stigmatized relationships as it is now. But you're right. You know, when I talk to member it it always in the beginning, it really surprised me because more members than not tell me I've been talking to the same model for 10 years. I've been talking to the same model for 15 years. And I really sat down one day and I'm like, what is it about these online interactions that is causing these two people to have a connection and a relationship for longer than most people that are meeting in day-to-day -day lives, much longer, right? The, the success rate of a model member relationship seems to be a little bit higher, honestly. But what I think it is, one of my hypotheses, is that when you are sharing such vulnerable aspects of who you are and that person accepts you and doesn't judge you and you feel safe with them, I mean, that's incredibly bonding. Of course, you're going to go back to that because we don't have many places in our life where we experience that. I absolutely agree. I think, um, well, first of all, the first thing you said, yes, these relationships are highly stigmatized, like many forms of alternative, like many alternative forms of sexuality, whether that's from the LGBTQ community, from king fetish BDSM communities, from technology mediated uh, sexual interaction, and including uh, camming or relationship that are oriented towards machine, everything that is not, that kind of falls outside of the scope of heteronormativity, as it's <laughs> as it's time in the sun, uh, in terms of stigma, uh, it, it, so it seems. Uh, so camming obviously is is uh, adding also the layer related to the stigma related to sex work. Uh, it just comes together. So the stigma of a parallel relationship, technology mediated relationship, and sex work. This is just converged to create a nice cocktail of of people's weird assumptions and misconception about uh, what this is. But in reality. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, people are go, uh, are there for the pleasure, but they're there for the human connection. And these connections, they are valuable in their own rights. Uh, it, it's really something that uh, I think people really need to understand. They're not necessarily there to replace. They're not necessarily there to substitute. Uh, sometimes they're there to feel uh, a need, but in many cases, they're just another kind of relationships that people enjoy and might not or may have access, but they still want to go uh, with that route to get access to something that is precious to them. And I think you're you're right. It's the vulnerability. It's the judgment-free environment. It's it's being accepted for who you are. That's a very powerful experience uh, for us as as human beings. And we we search that in many of our relationships. Uh, not everyone has access to it. Not everyone's able to live through it. It's a very tough thing to be vulnerable with others about our desires. Uh, um, not only because, for instance, uh, 
like in the movies, just telling to the others actually what are our needs and whatnot actually leads to positive outcome because sometimes people don't accept us. There's also like the reality of, I mean, telling to my uh, partner, for example, that I'm into uh, a very specific uh, sexual practice uh, that she might not be into, that's a risk maybe for a relationship because it puts, it exerts pressure. But I think um, we can learn a lot from uh, relationships that are uh, between members and models when it comes to connection, to communication and honesty. Like, I, I think the first thing that any sexologist or therapist or uh, anyone studying sex research or sex ed will tell you is that the ground to a meaningful and important and lasting beneficial relationship is communication uh, and trust and honesty and, and respect of each other. And I think Live Jasmine has that uh, in many ways. And, and that's a good thing. Not always, like it's not always perfect, but uh, I think people are drawn to that aspect when it works well, it's, yeah, people might stay there for years because it's, it's such a unique, uh, important experience. What you're saying is echoing what I've heard a lot when I interview sex therapists or couple therapists, um, marriage and family therapists, which is that one of the things that they tend to find with couples they sit down with is that the couples are maybe physically engaging in sexual intercourse, but they won't talk about sex. They will not talk about their needs, their desires, their fantasies. Their... And like you said, and you mentioned earlier, there is this inherent risk, so to speak, when you have a fantasy that may not be common. And yeah. there's the fear of being rejected, or maybe you have been rejected by your partner. And so now either you're having to shut that part of yourself off which is hard to do, or maybe you're seeking it somewhere else like Jasmine or through another person. Yeah, absolutely. And and you said uh, uncommon, and you're absolutely right. Maybe it's in a typical uh, preferences uh, that you have. But in many cases, it's actually very common sexual fantasies or preferences. The most common sexual fantasies in the world is threesomes. And just talking for couples to talk and and acknowledge the fact that they're interested in other people uh, and, and would like to maybe explore some form of monogamish type of arrangement or, or even like open relationship swinging and, and so that is is very stressful uh, for people they, they feel it's a risk uh, to their the relationship because maybe people feel that they're not enough uh, for their partner and that's tough to hear uh, because we've created a myth around human eroticism and the myths of love that are so entrenched in our society that it's it's the love of my life it's one person forever it's uh it's it's my prince charming it's it's but the and and this person should be meeting all of my emotional and, and sexual needs. That is, that is, we don't expect that from any other relationships, whether that be friendship, uh, whether that be all kinds of family relations, we don't expect that of anyone except from our partners. How bunkers is that? <laughs> like, the, of course it's, I'm not saying monogamy is problematic or bad. I'm saying it's not the only model and it's definitely not necessarily what works for everyone. And having multiple kinds of erotic relationships, sometimes including uh, with others like technology mediated ones, uh, uh, porn, uh, maybe eventually robots and artificial agents and, and with our human partners, whether that be one partner or multiple, I think it just speaks to the complexity of our intimacy and sexuality. And, and kind of reveals a truth that we don't like to hear much is that the models that we've been fed uh, and that we've integrated, they're good sometimes, but in in sometimes they fail in at, in one's life or they fail for certain individual. And uh, we need to to accept alternative models. You're touching on something that is very interesting because what it really comes down to at its foundation and core is how we've been educated and programmed. So like you said, in general, most people more or less have been programmed for monogamy. However, science, there is research that shows that human beings are actually not naturally monogamous. We're very conscious and we can choose that. 
But I, I interviewed Dr. Wednesday Martin, who's done a lot of work on, you know, women's sexuality. And she wrote the book Untrue, which is her whole premise is that it's not true that women are just so much more monogamous than men per se, or that they're just not as interested or thinking about sex as much. They are, but we have been programmed and taught a certain narrative that actually may not even well, we know it's not based on science. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree with Wednesday. <laughs> uh, but the, um, I think it's also important, like, just let's take a, a step back. One, I think of the first thing that uh, we need to deconstruct, I think, in people's mind is that uh, there's such a thing as human nature and there's such a thing as sexuality as a monolithic concept that is stable. Our eroticism is something that we constantly reinvent, that is constantly evolving, the same way that there's no human nature. There's no one, if it's our, we've been evolving over time, we're continuously evolving. Sometimes it feels like slow, uh, sometimes we feel like pretty quick, uh, socially as individual as well. There's also mourning where uh, you feel young and incredible and others that you feel like, wow, I'm, I'm 60 like this morning, this is pretty intense. Uh, so uh, same thing with our uh, our sexuality and eroticism. It is not like we've been trying to define and naturalize humans and humanness and sexuality and and what is sexuality as something that we can grasp. That's something that is, is stable, like love. Same thing with love. We do that constantly. Um, so our our eroticism is if if we have to reduce it to something is yes, it's evolutionary shaped. It is socially constructed and it is experience dependent. And experience dependent is extremely important because it means that we learn it. We learn it, we experience it, we create association between what feels good, what feels bad, what feels neutral. We pair that with all kinds of stimuli and we change over time as, as an individual. Just bringing back to this core idea of evolution, so sociocultural concepts and experience dependence and learning just reminds us that the the nature and structure of our relationship and what gives us pleasure, how we want to get into intimate relationship and the structure of these relationships can be extremely broad. And it can be in part learned. At some point, we need to start at some of the foundation. We need to educate people about diversity, about sexual pleasure, about bodies and anatomies and these things. And the fact that it's okay to desire and experience all kinds of uh, different pleasure and, and needs and relationship structures. So I think it's at the moment where we should be much further as a society when it comes to sexual freedom, about health, about sex ed and these things, we have these big, important, transformative moments of what with regards to technology, with regards to space, and we're trying to keep up. We're trying to keep up as individual and as societies. And it's a long answer to say that I agree with everything uh, Martin has done, but I think we need to get back to some of the basis and agree on on a few uh, on a few things that we need to educate our population uh, and provide that at baseline. And I think it won't come from public uh, funded organization because uh, of conservative rise. It'll have to come through, for example, technology in many ways to provide access. For some people, it comes with live jasmine. Uh, I've I've read testimonies of people who are like I've. I never understood how to make a woman come. I didn't just, I, I didn't understand it. Like I, I didn't have like a practical kind and like the, there's no information or there is information, but it's, it's, it's not accessible. It's not fun to search for. It's not great. And I had this connection with this model and she just taught me, like she just taught me how to be a, a better partner. I think technology can do that. Um, so I'll stop there for this answer, but I just like touch on plenty of stuff, but it's, it's a very complex uh, subject. Absolutely. Human sexuality, does it get more complex? I don't know. <laughs> but no, you touch on a lot of important topics that I definitely want to go back to. Well, first of all, I just want to say that is one of my goal with these interviews is to give people information and to give people permission to explore their sexuality, because that's one of the points you you touched on, which is that 
you know, we're trying to keep up with all of these evolving things, but we don't even have the basics down. Many people don't even know themselves sexually. They don't even know their preferences because they've never been given the permission or been encouraged to explore that part of themselves. Absolutely, let alone with someone else. And uh, I, no, I think you, you're absolutely right. If anyone's listening right now, get yourself a sex ed book and uh, then get like go and touch yourself. Like <laughs> I, I mean, like these are my two. Get your uh, all your organs stimulated, your brains and your <laughs> your genitals. Like just, I, I think everyone kind of uh, needs to just. First of all, acknowledge that their desires and needs are perfectly normal and valid um, and that they should get out there and explore and find the courage in themselves. And that's not an easy thing. It's very easy for me to say, not easy for maybe some of you listener might, uh, right now to actually apply, but give yourself the permission to explore yourself. Uh, start with your own body and then maybe get online and, uh, and try to explore a, a few things. There are amazing resources uh, um, go to kinkly.com, go to uh, to Live Jasmine if you want, go uh, um, on ethical uh, or porn sites, uh, whatever, find a mix of resources that fits uh, your interest. Both, I, I think the best combination would be like, don't go to porn to find sex ed, <laughs> not the right place. It's entertainment, that's great, enjoy it, that's, uh, that's wonderful. If you want like factually accurate uh, sex ed, then go to specialized websites and, and talk to experts and, and whatnot or follow them. I think uh, they'll be uh, very informative, but a good mix of the both I think is, is, uh, is the way to go on top of being uh, explorative and open with yourself. So it's a nice triad, it's like, find pleasure, find yourselves, find sex ed, <laughs> like kind of make that like a project. A... <laughs> it's like a fun project. Get to know yourself. <laughs> exactly. What do you do this weekend? I mean, <laughs> you have a list, you have a checklist. <laughs> yeah, that's a great place to start. I'm curious, what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions or misrepresentations of human sexuality right now? Yeah, when you sent me that question, I I was puzzled because there's so many. Like, I'm like, where do we start with uh, misrepresentation and misconception? Um, I think we obviously talk, uh, we've been talking for many years a lot about uh, female sexual pleasure, uh, women's sexual pleasure, LGBTQ rights, uh, and their representation. Uh, that's all important. But I'll actually stick to two that are quite dear to my heart uh, as well, on top of those is male sexuality. Uh, men and male sexuality is just <laughs> so poorly represented uh, in terms of its diversity uh, in media. Uh, I think for good reason, we focus uh, a lot on um, uh, the sexual empowerment of women, their sexual agency, and that's uh, really important, and also showing the diversity of sexual preferences throughout the LGBT community. But it's weird because in most areas, uh, it's a male-dominated world, the patriarchy and whatnot. In sex tech, actually, it's a lot driven by uh, women and uh, femme tech entrepreneur and LGBTQ entrepreneur, and, and, and that's wonderful. It's actually one of the nice places, perhaps because uh, they were unsatisfied in other areas and they were like, we're going to do it ourselves because no one else would. Yeah, yeah. And also because of the, quali the poor quality of sex that uh, they might have been having in their daily lives, and they're like, Fuck that, <laughs> we're going to go and just uh, make the products that we need, the connections that we need, the technologies that we need, and meet the people and community that we need. And that's it's fantastic. In the meantime, we've kind of like compounded what male sexuality is, and we just assume that this is uh, what it is. Like big dudes who always want to, uh, always want it, or uh, that would just have sex with anything that you. Uh, intimacy and connection is uh, not important, that men don't need to be touched, don't need to be hugged, don't need to be vulnerable, don't need to be honest with their initial. And I mean, Live Jasmine has capitalized <laughs> big time uh, on, on this actually vulnerability and openness. And, and that's uh, that's great. And I think that's what keeps a lot of men uh, on these platform, aside from uh, seeing beautiful women and uh, the sexual component is just because they can explore their own intimacy through that process. So I think we're we're actually misrepresenting a lot um, male sexuality and men sex uh, the sexuality of men's in media and uh, or 
in many ways, we kind of assume that's like a deal that's already been like, it's fine. Oh, we know, like we know <laughs> it's very clear. It's very easy. And because of that, the, the models and representation that men have is what they think that it should be. And I think there's a distortion there. The second point uh, is, is just basically how sex happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think one of the most hilarious uh, scene, and it's a given. It's a given that that's what you see in movies, that in TV series, and you might have some amazing steamy sex uh, at home, and good for you. That's great. That might have happened to you, but sex in practice rarely happens. Uh, Oh, you get back from the bar and you rip each other's clothes and you throw each other uh, in the in the walls and. Uh, that scene where someone throws the laptop and everything, I'm like, I, I have yet to see someone who's actually happy about it. You throw my laptop on the ground or like someone else's laptop, it's like, okay, I'm glad you're really into this and you're really attracted to me, but like, if you break my laptop, we're done. Like, this is the end of, uh, uh, of the interaction. And also this, um, this kind of a spark of passion, which is great, it, it happens as well, but it also, uh, in, in when it comes to couples, we have this assumption that, uh, and it's if you want to learn more, and you just go read the amazing work of Dr. Laurie Brado, that sex and sexual desire is something spontaneous. And it is sometimes spontaneous. Uh, but in many cases in couples, it's something also you need to spark. It's something you need to cultivate. It's something that you need to pay attention to, that you... Sometimes you're not necessarily in the moon or you're just neutral, but you need to get going. <laughs> um, and I think we miss these kinds of representation. And that all being said, like that's more like the initiation phase of sex and, and, and the ongoing that is totally misrepresented in TV series and shows is also the end. We rarely like what happens after the end of sex. Like, OK, we're here. By the way, I'm talking about uh, if they're sexual or like actually sex maybe involving men and, and women uh, or just males but like there's a cleaning phase and that you never see you never no one talks about uh, the fact that sex is messy sex uh, people giggle so people like there's body fluids there stuff like that it's like it's a messy endeavor um but in movies and tv series and representation it's all beautiful and clean and amazing and there's nothing but let's face it first of all it doesn't last necessarily an hour uh, most uh, most relationships, uh, I mean, with preliminaries and just like they are mm, twenty to thirty minutes. Most sexual interaction with penetration, three to five. <laughs> like the also the expectation that like the representation and these things. It's I think we're not representing sex uh, correctly. Of course, if I'm uh, someone who's making a movie or a TV series and yeah, maybe representing like sex as a normal thing or like how it actually goes is quite boring for the auditor. So I understand why they're not doing that and they might want to project something more interesting for the their auditors. But yeah, these are the two I would uh, focus on. So you, your question was really like, what key aspects of human sexuality um, are often misunderstood or misrepresented? Male sexuality, and it's the desires in, in its many forms and how sex happens <laughs> just in practice. It's uh, and I think it just plays with people's imaginaries and fantasies and expectations and expectations. Expectations is huge. And to to your point, I have noticed through my work in this interview series that male sexuality is not looked at as much as female sexuality. That is definitely something I have consciously noticed and it's not represented as much. And yeah, yeah sorry. I think like the, the often say, oh, we focused like pharmaceutical companies. I've, I've uh, focused a lot on erectile dysfunction and Viagra and, and these products. And that's absolutely true. And much less research sometimes on the pharmaceutical side uh, with women. But when it comes to pleasure, desires and like the diversity, I think we have like some some more work <laughs> in that area that needs to to be done. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because once again though this comes back to education and getting those basics down. I recently interviewed um a professor who her emphasis was more on female sexuality, but you know, one of the things she said that makes her students angry or brings them to tears when they realize it is that you know, 
there's 10,000 nerve endings in the clitoris. And there's much fewer in the actual vagina because, I mean, that gives birth to babies. You don't want more there. It would hurt more. And so why isn't, why aren't women taught and men taught to focus on the clitoris, which is literally an organ that is only for pleasure? Absolutely. So, right? I mean, yeah, to me, it's it's a question that's super important and mind boggling, but I would just, I would kind of want to first re-ask another question to anyone who's asking like why are people just not talking about pleasure as like part of sex ed and, and sexual health like if we can just also normalize the conversation around pleasure we might also normalize the conversation around how to get pleasure and and in the process of really practice like focusing on the clitoris and and focusing on the, all kinds of bodily stimulation not genital but just overall sensei kind of uh, uh experiences but actually I'm asking that as a rhetorical question, but why aren't we focused on, on, on the pleasure in the clitoris? Because at basis we, again, we're having difficulty getting accurate sex ed into basic curricula. It creates a whole kinds of amazing social debates that are, I mean, we should be way past that, uh, as, as a society. So now just pushing people. I think we just kind of need to get the conversation going. And many people have been doing that. Um, I think we are, I, I think in many ways, but maybe I'm living in a bubble. We have plenty of femtech entrepreneurs. We have plenty of good sex educators that are just going out there being vocal, uh, you included with the interviews that you do as experts, more and more uh, people just, just talking about the clitoris and getting clitorate. Um, so that's, that's, I, I think we're doing it the basis where the people should learn about their anatomy and these kinds of like truth bomb being like you are equipped with one of the most amazing organ in the entire world like enjoy because <laughs> that's one of nature's amazing gift uh we're not even like at that level of uh, normalizing we're we're having trouble normalizing saying uh, gay uh, vagina vulva penises crotums and like it uh, to uh talking to children about their anatomy. Like we're having trouble getting that uh, across school boards and and because of it. So saying to them like, well, your body's good, you can masturbate and that's a good thing. And it's okay for you to touch yourself because yes, newsflash children touch themselves. Like, and people have uh, not necessarily in a sexual way, not necessarily in a way that they understand it or it's kind of like a sexual pleasure, but it's just like weird stimulation, yes. That also happens. Like we're not even able to acknowledge these basic human things. So, again, why do we don't talk about the clitoris? Because we're having trouble talking about sex in just in the and normalizing it, normalizing this discussion. Why? <laughs> if if I, I if I'm able to answer that properly, seriously, give me a Nobel or <laughs> give me like a. I, there's thesis and thesis upon thesis and work and scholarly work of where this comes from. Yes, our sociocultural upbringing obviously is a key competitor um, in that area tied to religion and, and and the control of women's body. And <laughs> it's such a big question. Why are we here? Why are we there? Ugh. Because people think pleasure is chaos. People think sex is the the devil because uh, it is going to unleash chaos. Because if people masturbate, I mean, like they'll riot. I don't know. Seriously, I don't know. Like that, that's I'm I'm kind of. I know I'm not answering, kind of dodging the question. Uh, at the same time, it's just because like it's so complex. But I think it definitely has historical and sociocultural roots. I think. Um, yeah, there's evolutionary shaped roots also in the competition and the way our relationship are structured, that's for sure, but it's been compounded with years and years and years of, of, of religiosity of social cultural norms related to trying to control around human sexuality and especially control women's sexuality and reproductive rights. Um, that's where I would start uh, my answer, but there's plenty of people much more educated in the history of these ideas that I think uh, would be great to interview. You know, because of this cultural, societal discomfort, which is found in most places in the world regarding sex, 
we don't have as much research on human sexuality as we do on other things. I always joke to people, I am, I am actually serious about this, that we know more about the moon than human sexuality. I make that joke, but I want you to tell me, because at the start of our call, you talked about sex in space. Yeah. So tell me, is it true that we know more about the moon than human sexuality? And as I'm sure everyone, when they heard you say that, is wondering, sex in space, question mark? Talk to us more about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'll put that baseline that I don't know if we know more about. But I would venture uh, and speculate that, yes, we probably know more about the moon because it's a much more sim it's a much simpler system uh, than humans i mean uh it's not a simple system but it's a simpler system than humans and human uh, experiences uh, here on earth so yes i probably think we, <laughs> even like when it comes to sexuality we probably know more about the moon than uh, about human sexual uh, activities and intimacy and intimate connections um yeah, space sexology. I mean, the uh, we are going as a species uh, out of this Earth. <laughs> uh, our um, our space sector is booming. It's a trillion dollar industry with people going there for military, political, uh, economic reasons, um, commercial reasons, uh, including tourism, but also space mining and getting resources. I think it's really important uh, to just get back to the basics. There are three fundamental reasons why we need to go into space. And I think that's the question I, I get the most at baseline. Before I even get into space sexology, they're like, why space? Uh, I was like, why space? Because for survival, to get our resources elsewhere and stop destroying uh, our planet and for discovery. These are the three key fundamental reasons why we need to go into space and invest massively into our capabilities to operate outside of human atmosphere. Now, because we know that, and maybe people don't agree with that, uh, and I mean, <laughs> that's fine, uh, but we're still going. So <laughs> the, the, the idea is that there, um, with the recent advance in the last decades of uh, space exploration, especially on the commercial side, uh, innovations like SpaceX, or Virgin Galactic, and whatnot, our capabilities to reuse rocket and develop vehicles and habitats in space has just tenfolded. And because of that, it's leading to a somewhat like, let's say, a democratization of space. It's not a democratization. No, not everyone will have access to it, especially for a long period of time. But at least there's more and more people that are going that are not just astronauts, military trained engineers uh, and doctors that are going to the space station, although their sexuality is really important and we need to study it. And that's why space sexology exists as well. But also because more and more people will be invited to go to space from citizen scientists to uh, to tourists to uh, and eventually settlers, people who are going to either do long space journeys or settle new um, planets and worlds and live on them on a permanent basis. So by twenty by the end of 2025, between 2025 and 2027, we should be back on the moon uh, with probably the first women and first person of color setting uh, foot. So <laughs> yay us. Uh, the, the, the next stage uh, in the, these programs are, are push towards Mars. And uh, in the push towards Mars, we need to acknowledge that uh, living in space for long periods of time, and if we want to set all new words, we need to take into consideration human needs in a very comprehensive way. So we need to take into account human intimacy and sexuality, our sexual needs, obviously in a very practical reason, but also everything that comes around it, uh, our relationships, uh, our power crew dynamics, cases of gender, sexual harassment, uh, if, what happens if someone gets pregnant, uh, happens if someone dates uh, another crew member but they break up and <laughs> how does that affect crew performance and uh, and eventually also if we want to just reproduce and become fully independent from earth uh, because that's the goal uh, we ultimately need to eventually find ways to reproduce and raise children <laughs> on on other worlds so that's what space exology is all about it is exploring all of this and i think um I'll leave you with this to really grasp the um, the magnitude of this this field and project, uh, and that's what it's an it's an equation that I use in many conferences and podcasts to to make really people understand like what we're up against. Think think about like the complexity 
of human sexuality and intimacy on earth. Right? <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's more complex than the moon. <laughs> um, now, multiply that by the complexity of living in space, which is an isolated, confined, extreme environment where you need to live in artificial habitats with a limited number of individuals for long periods of time. Okay. <laughs> and then multiply this by time. And then you kind of have an idea of, of what this field is supposed to study and supposed to provide solutions for so that we can move forward as a species. So that's what me, uh, myself and my colleague are working on, both, I, I should say, in robotics and space technology. I don't work alone. I am a huge collaborator. I work with teams of brilliant scientists, just to name a few, Dave Antil, Maria Santa Guida, Jessica Shuka on my aerobotic side, as well as uh, Laurie Brato, David Lafortune at UCAM and UBC. On the space exology side, I am so fortunate to work with people like uh, Egbert Edelbrock, who's CEO of Spaceborne United, Alex Leyendecker, who's an Air Force pilot, pilot selector, but also has a doctorate in <laughs> astrosexology, and uh, Justin Laymiller from the, uh, the the Kinsey Institute and and also the one and only Shana Pandya who's look I cannot enumerate her list of accomplishments uh, she's just Wonder Woman I don't know where she sleeps she's an MD physician pilot aquanaut taekwondo uh, uh, black belt uh, she's a uh, medicine expert extreme is like chief medical officer for Luxonics uh, she's just uh, she's our captain on these endeavors. She she she's one of my idol, uh, and I'm just fortunate to to work uh, with her and her team. So, uh, I, I'm I'm putting all their names out there uh, just to and I mean Maria also and they works on both aerobotics and space technology and I love them and Judith Lapierre as well. So shout out to you all if eventually you're uh, you're listening. But I'm surrounded by amazing and brilliant minds and. Um, all of the work that I'm talking today uh, to you about is is also because of them. Well, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to interview two of the people you named, Justin Lay Miller and Lori Brado. <laughs> and I'm, I'm extending the invite to everyone else you named as well, too. They are more than welcome to join Life in Red for an interview. Absolutely. Uh, you should you should have uh, any of them on, on this podcast. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting to me when you were talking about us basically colonizing something, a planet like Mars, and you were saying, you know, we'd have to be living in artificial en enclosements and we'd only be with a limited number of people, obviously limited resources. It made me think, so basically we're going back to the beginning because I'm sure that at some point in our human history as we're evolving and the, you know, the conditions on the planet itself, from my understanding, were very harsh at one point. And over time, it's become more sustainable for life as we have it now. But it just sounded like we are basically going to, yeah, starting at the beginning on a different planet where the conditions are harsh and then let me ask you this i'm really curious would we on earth my understanding is we eventually evolved into what we needed so we got out of the ocean and grew legs right so would we start evolving on mars like would our biology start conforming eventually to what is needed for that habitat yeah there's people who uh, actually study that uh, how evolution and just to uh, for for the auditors to just give a reminder, like ourselves as individuals, aside from maybe changing in our lifetime, um, it's not really us who's changing, it's our genetic material and how we, we reproduce. And maybe some people will reproduce more because they'll fit more some of these uh, these conditions and be better adapted to it, while others um, might proportionally survive less and reproduce or reproduce less and in doing so those with certain characteristics will pass on uh, these characteristics and genes so I think that's really important like I know I know we shortened it like say oh we grew legs <laughs> when we came out uh, of the water but we didn't grow legs like we over generation adapted and like there was an in-between where we're in water and in the beginning and because of that advantage then they were able to do and yes absolutely uh, you're totally right that um, some people are actually asking these questions Will we uh, experience some form of speciation if, on a sufficiently long period of time if you have multi-generational um, human development uh, outside of Earth? Will these individuals adapt 
uh, over generations to these condition. And I think yes, in some ways, but in the meantime, um, I wouldn't venture to speculate too much. We can see that maybe and test that actually with uh, with fruit flies, with insects, with maybe uh, non-human animal models uh, like rats and so on to just see some of the effects. Because right now we're really invested in looking into the effects of like microgravity, artificial uh, gravity, uh, total weightlessness, radiation is such a huge uh, problem uh, and such a huge challenge. And radiation actually affects our DNA, so. That so we could see maybe and speculate that maybe some of the individuals who will be able to to rep, uh, replicate to survive and reproduce uh, more might be a bit more radio uh, radiation less radiation sensitive uh, basically but it's really too soon to uh, to speculate uh, uh, about that. What we can anticipate is maybe that the the development and morphology of humans might change uh, a bit. For example, if you're in a less gravitational environment, maybe people will grow like taller or like with not the same kind of like muscular or bone density and 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 whatnot. And hence, um, aside if you kind of put other contingency measures, they might have trouble readapting to Earth's uh, condition or need some form of adaptation. Uh, but that needs to ha that, that might happen on long periods of time. The um, well, it happens like with the conditioning <laughs> uh, for astronauts, like their bone density, their muscle atrophy, and uh, these things. That's a, that's in their lifetime. But um, I mean, like for really like generational changes in the human species, it's totally possible. It is absolutely possible, not theoretically and practically. We just don't know what will exactly will that look like. In the meantime, I would just add to that that. One of the objective of NASA and space organizations uh, is also to, to try to shield humans from these problems and try to devise contingency measures. Because in the meantime, we need to bring our astronauts back <laughs> and we need to bring ideally our settlers back. And some people, ethicists, space ethicists argue that unless we have achieved some form of very advanced um, settlement, future Martians or future people living in other worlds, they should always have the opportunity to come back to Earth if there's a problem or they can choose to come back if they were born into space. They should also have the opportunity to come back to our beautiful garden. Um, and and so there's distinction and we need to make sure that we shield them from and give this give them this opportunity. So we need to shield them from, from radiation. We need to give them training and developmental um, protocols to make sure that gravity doesn't affect them, that they develop a healthy bone density, that uh, they in, in, uh, intake nutrients and sleeps and stuff like that. We are, we are creatures that have evolved in a very specific environment, and now we're going in the opposite. <laughs> There's nothing more hostile than, than space. And when I say space, I include what's in it, like a supernova and whatnot, but at baseline, we are not meant to survive there. But we are not meant to survive in plenty of places also on Earth, and we are adapting. So that's that's our strength. With my colleague Dave uh, Anctil, uh, we wrote Foundations of Aerobatics to just create a feel and an approach and a way of and some concepts to how can we approach um, studying uh, a field that would be at the intersection of human-machine interaction and sexology. So we merged uh, those two fields to create what aerobatics uh, is today. Now, while we were doing that, um, we were thinking a lot about the applications of aerobatic technology and sex tech. And, and I mean, we rapidly realized that one of the most advantages, uh, biggest advantage of these technologies is uh, sex at a distance, remote connections, uh, having sex when you're in isolated or you don't have access to intimate partners, and what is more isolated <laughs> and confined and extreme and problematic than space. So with everything that was also uh, happening on the space sector, it just again clicked. Like it was a Eureka moment. I woke up one morning and I wrote to Dave and I'm like, I know what we have to do. Uh, and so we wrote a piece for the conversation in relation to our work uh, related to aerobatics. Um, I think it's called um, Sex Tech in Space. Could technology meet the uh, intimate needs of astronauts? And it just went, I wouldn't say viral, but it got like a lot of traction a few years ago. And because of that, a uh, company, uh, WeVibe, the sex toy company, uh, which is which at the time was uh, owned by Wow Wow Tech Group, who is now a part of Love Honey Group, 
um, the approach us of like, oh, we're actually interested. Would you, would you like to expand uh, on your thoughts about that in a report? So we said, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. So we were doing that and we really realized at some point that we just, again, needed to take a step back because we were already devising solutions for astronauts to masturbate and connect with their partners or maybe use virtual partners and agents, virtual agents to, or virtual environments to, um, to just meet their intimate and sexual needs. When actually there was a lack of research on sex and on their sexual basic sexuality, so we took a step back again, and in a seriously like uh, an episode of a boost of energy that I would only describe in a non-clinical uh, term as a manic attack, <laughs> like uh, or mania. I just wrote the case for uh, based on some of our work, the case for space sexology. Um, and then with my team, with Dave, with Maria, with uh, a, a student that was working with me and now uh, is in law school uh, called Elisa Jacquerie and the amazing Judith Lapierre, who used to be one of our uh, really uh, astronaut candidates uh, back in the days. 